Good afternoon and welcome to our session, Equity and Inclusion Using an Emporium Model Approach. Our presenters today are Kelly Coltis and Tyler Price, faculty members at the University of Louisville. If you have any questions for the presenters during the session, please feel free to enter those into the Q&A section at the bottom of the Zoom room screen, and we will address them at the end of the talk. On that note, I'll hand it on over to Kelly and Tyler. Thank you. Um, I will share my screen. Does that look okay on your end, Marissa? Yep. Beautiful. That's great. All righty. Well, thank you all for being here um, for our uh, presentation on equity and inclusion using the Emporium model approach in our math intervention courses. My name is Kelly Coltis. Um, I'm an assistant director here at the University of Louisville um, in Reach Math Resources, which is our um, uh, undergraduate support for uh, academics. Um, I work with our Gen 103, 104 classes, as well as some of our summer programs. Um, previously taught five years in the high school math uh, setting and have been with Reach since 2013, almost 10 years now. And hello, everyone. My name is Tyler Price. Um, I've been around at REACH for about five years now. I have a lot of experience working in our um, intervention math courses, Gen 103 and 104. I also work with our Summer Engineering Academy program um, and supervise our team of graduate student assistants here at UofL. So enough about me. We'll kind of go ahead and start with an overview of the session. So. What we're hoping to get through today is talk about the essential elements of our intervention courses in mathematics and mainly talk about their grounding in the Emporium model and the features that go along with that, which include adaptive learning, mastery learning, and guided instruction. Um, the big kind of punchline here that we're excited about is since adopting this approach, we've consistently achieved pass rates of approximately 70%. And our analysis shows that there is not a correlation between pass rate and ethnicity. So what we'd like to do is share the steps that we've taken to redesign our courses, and then kind of highlight the features of the Emporium model that we think have helped us achieve these more equitable outcomes in an inclusive classroom environment. So to give you a little bit of context and set the stage here, just a, a little bit of information about REACH. REACH is the University of Louisville's academic support unit. It stands for Resources for Academic Achievement. Um, it's been around at the university for about 20 years now. Um, we have a lot of operations, but the big thing we do, at least in math resources, is offer the two um, intervention math courses at the university. Those course titles are Gen 103 and 104. Um, we, from our kind of modest beginnings from roughly 10 years ago, we've now grown to 1,800 students in this last school year. So it's quite a large student population. Um, the other things we do are tutoring services, student success workshops, um, academic coaching, and then a number of summer bridge programs. And all these services are offered free to students. All right, and also to kind of set the stage, I know many of you in the audience are probably um, working in intervention math or developmental math courses already. Um, but for those of you who are not, um, it's kind of good to give a little information and background about that. So although um, developmental math is an area that's easy to overlook, mainly because it's not housed in a traditional academic department, um, we think that these are sites where issues relating to diversity, equity, and inclusion are especially relevant. Um, the main reason for that is because minority students as they enroll in universities are more likely than their white peers to be placed into developmental coursework and less likely to complete these requirements. Um, and as you can kind of imagine, getting stuck in a cycle of having to repeat these developmental math courses or failing these courses leads to increased rates of attrition. And that really does serve to kind of compound the educational inequities that have already built up in the system um, from pre-K or K through 12. So we think it's very important to kind of focus on these classes if the goal of the university is to promote DEI initiatives. 
Another thing too, we like to kind of talk about up front. Um, one big longstanding um, topic of discussion in developmental math is the achievement gap. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that terminology. Um, it mainly documents um, the difference in um, achievement between white students and other minority groups uh, on standardized tests. Um, these tests include things like the National Assessment of Education Progress, um, as well as their academic performance in the actual courses at school. One thing we like to do is kind of shift the terminology on this. Um, we like to refer to it here at Beach as an opportunity gap, mainly because that draws attention to the kind of societal factors that go into constructing this gap in achievement. So it draws attention to things that are sort of outside of the student's control. Um, we think this, you know, other than just being a shift in terminology, it does kind of focus a more solution-based approach to solving problems in the classroom. Just a little bit more context about our um, situation here at the University of Louisville specifically. Uh, we are a state-supported research university in Louisville, Kentucky. The population of Louisville is roughly 600,000 with the metro area, including Southern Indiana, around 1.3 million. Um, the enrollment of UML is a little bit over 23,000, roughly 70% of the students here are white, while 30% belong to a minority group. Like I mentioned earlier, as with developmental math courses nationally, uh, minority students are overrepresented in our class specifically, with about 45% being minority and 55% being white out of our 1,800 students in our course. All right, so before we give you kind of a long string of information, um, we did this presentation at other conferences and tried to incorporate a little bit of an activity um, to get the audience engaged. It's a little bit difficult, obviously, over virtual um, conferences, but this is an activity that I like to do with our graduate student assistants as they come in for training in the fall and start the school year. So what we'll do is I will pose a couple questions that have a numerical answer and just kind of think about these questions to yourself so you can kind of play along at home and see how many that you get right. But we'll go through here and talk about the answers. All right, so kind of think about this to yourself. Nationally, around what percent of freshmen entering four universities four-year universities are placed into intervention math courses. And here are the different choices here. There's 20%, 30%, 40%, 40%, 50%. I hope you locked in your answers. Um, the correct answer is 40%. So we like to talk about this with our graduate student assistants because it does highlight some of the deficiencies in the math education system um, coming from K through 12. Obviously, many people know that the state of math education is not necessarily yeah. ideal, and around 48% of incoming students do require some sort of math intervention course. Um, you'll note that this number is pre pandemic, so mm -hmm. I imagine, um, you know, in the last few years, that number has been anything but. Um, All right, question number two here. Students requiring at least two intervention math courses are what percent less likely to graduate than students who are not required to take any intervention courses at all? And you can read the options there 25, 50, 75, or 100%. All right. Correct answer there is 75%. So we like to bring this up. Because as you know, we've talked about earlier, um, these classes, if caught in kind of that cycle of having to repeat these, can cause uh, increased rates of attrition. So those who are placed and, and have to go through long sequences of developmental math courses are significantly more likely to drop out of school than people who don't have to take any developmental courses. So it is very important both that we get students through these courses and that we shorten the um, number of courses that they have to take as they try to earn their degree. All right, final question here about what percent of students in college introductory courses experience at least mild math anxiety? All right, 
I'm going to view our answer here. That answer is 85%, which I do think really speaks to how mathematics as a subject of study can cause anxiety in people. There's many cultural reasons for that, I'm sure, um, but our students are not only kind of a vulnerable population in the university at large, but with this subject area specifically, there's a lot of anxiety and sort of cultural baggage that goes into it. So it's really important that as instructors, we be aware of this and try to turn around that in any way that we can. And I'll hand it off to Kelly. All right. So in our presentation, we are going to address the following four guiding questions. One, what are equity and inclusion? I will try to define those for you. Um, two, what is the Emporium model? Uh, I know some people may be using it or have heard a little bit about it, but uh, we will kind of go through and define what it actually is, what the essential elements of the Emporium model are, and then we'll spend a large part of the presentation describing how we actually redesigned our intervention courses using the Emporium model. So hopefully there will be at least a couple takeaways that um, you could use or consider um, if that's something you're interested in. So guiding question one, what are equity and inclusion? Um, so I think it's very important that we um, make note that equity and equality are not the same thing. Um, sometimes they're used interchangeably. Um, sometimes there's a little bit of confusion around those. And if uh, you don't have a clear picture of those, that's totally fine. Um, but equality um, is where students are supported in the same way, regardless of their individual needs. Whereas equity, uh, students are supported in a variety of ways in response to their individual needs. So differentiating instruction, using different methods, um, assessing you know, where students need help, and then trying to address the individual needs of each student. Um, inclusion is active and intentional and ongoing engagement with diversity. We really work hard and try to be very intentional about giving our students um, opportunities to share their perspectives personalities, who they are as a person holistically. Um, we always, always try to use language that's respectable and sensitive to differences. And if you know, we learn that there's a better way, you know, once you know better, do better. Um, we definitely try to recognize our own privileges, and implicit biases in our interactions with students, and definitely just try to make space for students who might feel otherwise excluded just have a sense of belonging in our classroom and feel like they're welcomed and they're wanted and they're valuable and that they can be successful in our classroom. Um, some ideas from the Chronicle of Higher Education for inclusive course design are to design courses in which you, the instructor, speak less, um, give lots of low stakes quizzes and assessments, um, set very clear expectations, uh, the more structure, the better for everybody. And obviously connecting with students personally, um, using their names, sharing pronouns, if that's if they're comfortable with that. Uh, don't force anybody to, but if they want to, it's always good to give space for that. Um, use different modes of communication and just acknowledging, you know, hard times. A lot of our students are working full time, going to school full time, and have a variety of other things on their plate. So just you know, recognizing I say in class multiple times a semester, I know my class isn't the only thing in your life. So like, how can we make it a priority for right now for what you need to get done to meet XYZ deadline? So what is the Emporia model? Um, the Emporia, Emporia model has been around for a while. Um, it replaces a traditional lecture with interactive instructional software and on-demand personalized assistance. So you need both pieces. You need an interactive instructional software and you definitely need the on-demand personalized assistance. Um, at least in our experience, both are very, very important. Um, getting away from that lecture format uh, allows our teaching resources to be distributed equitably rather than equally. So it's not a one size fits all. Um, some students, might need a lot of individualized help in one thing, but not the other. Um, and some students come in our class and never ask a single question, um, while others need a lot of help. So that allows us to give help where help is needed um, and to not bore the students who don't need our help. They can 
um, move forward and we'll talk more about our, our class being self-paced here in a bit. Um, but lecture students get the same information, same time, same way. Um, they're on the same pace with the same content, whereas Emporium um, allows us to customize our curriculum. There's on-demand learning aids built into the software as well as human help in the form of staff. Um, all of our students do all the same content, but they get to do it at an individualized pace, which is more equitable um, compared to the lecture model. Um, and the self-paced nature allows instructors to more easily identify gaps and student understanding and intervene earlier, you know, earlier, which is obviously uh, very important if you notice that a student does need a lot of help, you can connect them to resources early and often. With our campus partners. So there are 10 essential elements of the Emporium model. They're just listed here. Um, but we're going to go into those in more detail um, here in just a minute. But basically, it involves redesigning your course, meeting in a computer lab, using software, um, providing students with on-demand feedback from highly trained staff, uh, building an ongoing feedback, individualizing the student experience, uh, we require active learning and mastery learning, ensuring sufficient time on task, and monitoring student progress to intervene as needed, and then always, you know, measure learning completion and cost. Right. So, like we said, the main part of this presentation will be going through these individual elements and talking about the specific features and kind of describing those a little bit more, and also occasionally chiming in with how those features might lead to more equitable outcomes. All right, so the first essential element is to redesign the entire course sequence and establish greater consistency. So you can kind of see we have a, a chart here on the left before our course redesign. Um, those of you in other universities, this might look like something similar to how you have now or maybe used to have, but basically it's a somewhat longer sequence, in this case three, um, intervention math courses that students must go through if they're placed into the lowest level before finally getting onto their general education credit bearing math course. So that's quite a long path. Um, each of those arrows is really another point along the way someone could get caught up and eventually lead to attrition. So our goal after the course redesign was to really streamline this whole process. Um, students at the very most will have to take two developmental courses before moving into their credit bearing course. And in many cases, that's just one for our non-STEM majors. And we'll talk about this a little bit later, but even students placed into the lowest level, we do have a program to get both courses done in one semester. So we tried in a number of ways to really cut down on the number of attrition points as students move through their courses. And then here, just kind of a, a chart highlighting the differences between the old courses that we had to do, which were labeled as math 55, 65, and 85, versus our current our current classes, general 3104. Um, the old classes were much more of the traditional remedial style classes, um, whereas here we kind of treat them as intervention classes. The old classes were taught in a traditional classroom with a lecture um, out of a textbook and graded the old ABCF fashion. Um, our courses today are in a computer lab, as we'll talk about later. Our instructors serve as facilitators and guide students through the material rather than serving as a lecturer. Um, the textbook has been replaced by instructional courseware and a guided notebook that kind of accompanies um, each lesson. And then the course is now graded as fail instead of A, B, C, F. So in essential element two, um, we need to meet in a computer lab and use instructional courseware. This can be a big switch um, compared to a lecture-based uh, class model. Um, our students meet twice a week for 50 minutes in a computer lab. Um, it is a three credit class, but we only have two required meetings. And then there's lots of optional time for them to come in outside of that. Um, we have an average student to staff ratio of 10 to one, which is wonderful and incredible. And I know 
possibly not possible for everybody, probably not possible for everybody. But uh, we accomplish that by having one instructor, whether it's a full-time staff member or a graduate assistant in the room, plus two peer tutors who are trained specifically for the class. So if we don't have student staff, there's no possible way we could accomplish that. Um, but that is how we do it. And that's how students are able to get so much on-demand help. Um, and it's good for the tutors too. It's a good first job for them usually. Um, so we actually have two computer labs here. I forgot to mention, we have like a standard computer lab and then we have an overflow room that we use almost all day also. Um, where we have uh, laptops and a cart that can be used. Um, so that is an option. Um, if you don't have an actual lab, you can get creative, get one of the laptop carts with some laptops, and then you can use those in any room and kind of turn any room into a lab. Uh, all of our sections for Gen 103 and Gen 104 use Fox Learning. In particular, we use the introductory and intermediate algebra product, which has been really nice because the 103 students are kind of in the introductory material, whereas the 104 students are in the intermediate material, but they get to use the same product for both. Students complete all required assignments in the courseware, and that includes 35 lessons, four cumulative quizzes, and a final exam. All right. Did the third essential element is to provide students with on-demand assistance from highly trained staff. Um, like Kelly mentioned, our courses are facilitated by graduate teaching assistants and professional staff members. Um, we do our best to train um, each member of our team, um, go through a lot of training to make sure that they're ready to be in the classroom on day one. Some of the training materials that we've put together are a comprehensive instructor guide. We have two week long um, training for our graduate student assistants. Um, before the fall semester starts. So we have them come in August for a couple of weeks and do training each day. Um, we also have an online component to that training in the form of different modules. Um, we, we, even with our graduate student assistants, we try to emphasize things like inclusion through the use of welcome forms. We also have them complete a um, module through our Disability Resource Center here on campus um, and diversity awareness training as well. Um, we also try to keep that training going throughout the semester. So we have weekly staff meetings. Each graduate student meets one-on-one -on -one each week with a professional staff member. We also meet as a team each week to make sure we're on the same page. And we also have a system of observations and evaluations to kind of give that ongoing feedback as they work here to, throughout the course of a few semesters. Um, again, as Kelly mentioned, that we do have student staff and lots of them. We have peer tutors assigned to each class, at least one, but in most cases, two. Um, one component we like to highlight there, too, is we believe that peer tutors can help reduce the math anxiety some students might feel coming into a math classroom. Um, you know, math, math classrooms can sometimes be seen as, you know, a source of anxiety, mainly because people might have negative experiences being put on the spot in grade school or having to go up on the board and perform some sort of math problem as their peers watch. Um, so it is important to reduce that anxiety. And as professors, um, sometimes we don't always relate to the students uh, as well as people who are their age might as much as we uh, try. So it is good to have help from, you know, people who look like the two or the students talk like the students and are there and being friendly and very knowledgeable with the math. Um, our program and our training is certified by the College Reading and Learning Association. And again, with our tutors, we conduct those observations and evaluations over the course of semesters. Um, and the big thing that we emphasize is that all of our staff in the classroom should be active in seeking to help students. Um, and use that kind of techniques, including cognitive scaffolding and use guided instruction as students work through the lessons. Okay, essential element four, uh, build ongoing assessment and feedback. Like as we mentioned, uh, all of our courses do use the Hawks Learning Courseware. Um, so features that are really helpful for our students that they share that they like, um, and part of the reason why um, we picked Hawks in particular, the learning aids are really good. There's a lot of video clips, um, animated examples, step-by-step -step examples, explanations, things like that. 
there's instant feedback and it's really good feedback. Um, students do like that because if they're working, we have a lot of students who work third shift and they keep, you know, unusual non-business hours. Um, they can at least get some pointed feedback if they're working on their own so they don't feel like they're just, you know, <laughs> on an island trying to do math, they can get some help. Um, and there's like active technology. For the instructors, uh, it's very customizable uh, to our needs for what we want for our students. And there are numerous reporting features. So between all of those things, we do give our students a lot of feedback uh, very quickly, most of the time instantly um, through Hawks and then, uh, you know, reiterated and reinforced in person, you know, and we see them in class the next time, so. Right. The fifth essential element is one that's very important, and that's individualizing the student experience. Um, you know, like we mentioned, this one aspect of equality is just giving students all the same information and treating them the same, kind of regardless of where they're at. And if you've taught developmental mm -hmm. math, you know that our students do come from a wide range of backgrounds. Um, some students can move through material very quickly with little guidance. Some students need a lot of help and a lot of handholding as they go through the class. So we have students with very different levels of needs. So what we do is try to um, make the class individualized through the use of a proctored pre-assessment test. Um, that's given um, at the very start of the semester, first week of class, and it allows students to test out of lessons in the course that they already have demonstrated that they know how to do coming in. Um, another uh, aspect that many students really like about our class is that it can be completed at any time. Um, so we don't set any kind of, you know, maximum pace students can move through. It's really just a matter of how fast and how much effort they want to put into the course um, and they can get it done really at any time. There are incentives to doing that. Students who complete the course early, obviously they don't want to come back, but they do have two opportunities to take the final exam. Um, another thing we do is students who did not pass the class for whatever reason are not required to start over. We label them as returning students and we allow them to start at the course midpoint, which is quiz two. Um, that kind of gives them the opportunity to review um, topics that they've already done and last semester or at some point earlier, um, and then they finish the last half of the class. And then, like I mentioned earlier, we do have a half semester program um, where Gen 103 and 104 can be completed in one semester. Um, the numbers on that vary this semester. I think it's, you know, uh, around 15 or so students. In previous semesters, that number is as high as 40. So it is, um, you know, a useful thing for a lot of students to get through two um, courses in one semester. We're able to do that because like most universities, we do have some courses on an eight week schedule. So we just created an eight week second, second half of the semester course. Uh, so it works pretty well. Um, so require active learning. So this is really, really important. And one thing that I really like, um, I've taught lecture style and I'm taught in forum style and it is a big switch, but students are actively doing the math during class. Um, and hopefully outside of class too, but definitely during class. Um, so instead of watching somebody do math and then trying to do it on their own later, they get to do the math in the presence of somebody who can help them. Um, I like to equate it to like, watching ESPN versus actually playing basketball, like what's going to make you better actually playing. You can watch all you want. You can get good tips and tricks and ideas from watching, you know, professionals, but you really got to do the work if you want to actually get good. Um, we have the learn mode, which is basically um, what would replace like the textbook and lecture examples if we were doing a lecture. So students kind of get an opportunity lecture that way um, and they, there's lots of videos in the learn mode which I really like there's even a little watch button to have students who are resistant to taking math notes I'm like do an experiment just like watch all the videos and if you do nothing else just watch all the videos before you try to do a problem and that usually helps quite a bit um, we use a guided notebook and our guided notebook is a fill in the blank notebook that goes right along with the learn mode uh, it's customized to uh, what we use in our specific classes here at U of L. 
um, instructors and tutors are available for on-demand help. Um, this is the number one thing, because um, I know we've all been there. If we're in a lecture and a professor's giving an example and you get lost on the first step, it, you're still lost, even though they keep going. So <laughs> when you have the on-demand help, you can get help when you get stuck, and then you can keep going instead of just having all go over your head. Um, and because we are fairly large um, and well established, we do have a, a, a full blown like learning center that we're a part of. Math resource centers are just in math help for everything up to calculus two, including this course uh, with the intermediate and introductory algebra. So um, that's available uh, throughout the week, nine to five. Um, so some students really just sit in there and use that a lot. All right, and then we'll try to be cognizant of time here because I know that we're probably running a little bit too much. I'll try to roll through these a little quicker. The seventh essential element is requiring mastery learning. Um, so in our class, mastery means 80%. So as students go through the assignments, um, they're very low pressure and that we allow unlimited retakes. We're really just trying to get students to the point where they can get 80% and demonstrate enough mastery of the material to move through. Um, once they've done that, they'll take the common final exam. The bar is lowered there to a 70%. Um, there's a maximum of two attempts allowed for the final exam. That must be passed in order to pass the course. The common final exam is something we made in collaboration with our math department here um, to ensure that they're ready to move into the college algebra and other quantitative reasoning courses. So we ensure sufficient time on task. We do that through uh, numerous Hawks reports. Uh, we do weekly progress uh, time logs. And um, we have a pacing guide. We have a screenshot of an example there on the right side of the screen. Uh, but there's a page in the syllabus where every single week students know exactly what they need to do. And those dates are all programmed into Hawks as well. Um, so that gives clear expectations for deadlines and provides structure, which is good for everybody. So that like one semester and a page pacing guide, students really like that. Um, so if there's one takeaway, if you don't do that, that's one thing students really do make use of. Uh, we also have an attendance policy in our class. Um, so we say attendance and active participation are required, which does give them structure. It's a very flexible attendance policy. Um, we do monitor it in multiple ways. What we're using now, we've had obviously multiple variations of this in the past few years, but students can miss up to 10 class periods for any reason. So we say pre-excused, you know, not everybody has access to doctors or people who would give a doctor's excuse note, but if you don't feel well, stay home, that's fine. It's excused, um, but you're just not allowed to miss any more than 10 class periods. Um, and given that we only meet twice a week, that's five weeks of a 15 week semester. So that's quite uh, loose, but it's also very strict. Uh, there's no exceptions, no more than 10. All right, another thing, um, essential element nine here is to monitor student progress and intervene when necessary. Um, that early intervention is obviously very important. It's good to catch students who um, are starting to fall behind early because that means that they could be falling behind in other courses at, here at the university and we're a good place to kind of intervene and step in um, since we're kind of a smaller group. So we make use of a lot of reporting features in Hawks. I won't read all of those, but if you do have a Hawks product um, and you're kind of used just a small handful of uh, reports, there's a lot of really good ones here. Um, especially, you know, the time per lesson and student reports that can allow you to see um, how long students are spending on lessons, which can help you identify people who might be spending too much time on a lesson, or maybe some people who are spending a suspiciously short amount of time on lessons. So it's we make use of a lot of reports there. Um, another way that we do kind of intervention is through use of a deadline extension request form. Um, in our class, due dates are flexible to a large extent. Um, if a student misses the original kind of target date, uh, it's not like they receive an F uh, for that assignment. Um, we do extend the deadlines um, pretty far up into the semester for the most part. But in order to get a test unlocked after it's been overdue for more than a week, 
we do require them to fill out a short Microsoft form that just asks them basic questions. Um, it is very open-ended, so students do use that as an opportunity to disclose any challenges that they might be experiencing that are preventing them from getting things done. And at that point, we can follow up with the student and get them to the right place on, on campus. Um, now, if they go more than two weeks overdue on assignment, we go one step farther and have a meeting with the student that we call a plan of action meeting. Um, in that case, they actually meet with one of our professional staff members when they come into class. It's just mainly a check-in, not a, a time to scold the student or anything like that, but check in, see how they're doing, get them connected, develop a plan to get caught back up in the course, and then um, give them an additional extension on the assignment. So essential element 10, this is our last essential element. Um, it's obviously important to measure your learning, uh, completion and cost. Um, you can see our pass rates there. Um, one important note is in 2016, uh, we got to write our own final exam. Previously, we had to use the compass placement exam, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, and we switched to Hawks from a different product. Um, I have kind of a red line there at the 70% mark. Things were going well until fall of 2020 when they took a nosedive uh, for reasons I don't need to explain. Um, but we have kind of had a little bit uh, better results here in the last year or so, um, kind of coming out of this COVID. So one important thing to metric too is that we track students in the next class and approximately 70% of the students who pass our class then go on to pass their kind of very high class in their first try, as opposed to, um, you know, banging their head against the wall, which we do not want. Okay, one thing that we have uh, begun to take a closer look at in the past few, uh, about four years, is um, ethnicity and pass rate. Um, the details are up there. Um, the most important thing is that we have found that there is uh, no association between ethnicity and pass rate in any of these academic years that we've analyzed, uh, even throughout COVID, which um, we were very proud of because we know uh, COVID disproportionately affected a lot of different groups. Um, but there was, students were still able to be successful in our course. Um, that's kind of small, but you can see kind of the numbers we use there um, and our pass rates. Um, and just one thing I will mention we started to look at is like Pell eligible students versus non Pell eligible students, and we're finding similar things. Um, so that's uh, more good news, but uh, that's not ready for press yet, according to our executive directors. So you got a little nugget of information. Um, so, in summary, Using the Emporium model has allowed us to foster equity um, because we are serving as a facilitator rather than a lecturer. That doesn't mean a lecture-based class is bad. It just means if you have a lecture-based class, maybe you can weave some of these things in, uh, flip classroom ideas, things like that. So, um, but in ours, it is full-blown um, Emporium. So we are a facilitator. Uh, we have a lot more structure and resources and like accountability through attendance and things like that in our course. Uh, we do have a small class size, which allows us to know our students personally and build relationships. And then peer tutors give students a chance to learn somebody who relates to them. Um, it might help reduce anxiety. Uh, we do offer a lot of low stakes quizzes and assessments, which offer ongoing and immediate feedback, uh, thanks to using online courseware. Um, Having online courseware does allow access 24 seven, as long as the student's in a place with internet where they can work. Um, so all those help tools that are online are available 24 seven, which is great because that takes a little pressure off of you as the instructor to be the answer for everything. Um, online courseware grading is wonderful. Um, it can help remove instructor bias and allow instructors to spend their time analyzing data instead of creating it by grading paper after paper after paper. Um, it also makes the mastery learning a lot more feasible because, you know, everybody's in a million different places. And so the computer just creates it. You don't have to worry about the answer to anything like that. Um, we have very clear expectations. There are no surprises in our class um, because we do have very clear cut policies and deadlines. All right. And you can kind of see there, we do have a few um, resources. 
Um, I don't know if we'll be sending out PDFs as PowerPoint, but um, those are good articles to check out if some of these ideas are interesting to you and you're looking to incorporate elements of the Emporium model. And then hopefully we have answered these questions, maybe answered them for too long. Um, <laughs> and I think, Marissa, I think we're ready to move into the Q&A part. I know we only have five or so minutes left, but I did see that we got a couple of questions as we were going through the PowerPoint. Let me do a stop share first. Perfect. Thank you so much, you guys. Yeah, we did get a couple of questions. Uh, the first being, do you have a singular paid coordinator for, for organizing all of this and running the training as well as tracking the progress? Yeah, I think I heard most yeah. of that. Um, as if yes. I, yeah. <laughs> so, sorry, it can cut out a little bit, but yes. Um, so I am the course coordinator. So my name is on every single course. And then all of our other instructors are paired up um, with the courses that they're teaching and they're listed as a secondary instructor. So I coordinate um, kind of everything to keep everybody doing the same stuff. Um, but then the face-to-face -face instructor would be somebody like Tyler or one of our other staff or GSAs. Um, and then I usually get to teach like maybe one or two, which is the best part of my week. So, <laughs> sorry if I wasn't um, coming in strong. Um, okay. Can we, there is an interest in getting uh, this slideshow? Would you be open to sharing the the slideshow PowerPoint presentation as well? We would. Um, you can send it to us, and we can have it provided for um, all instructors along with the recordings. We will be sharing uh, re all recordings in the coming days. Um, but the PowerPoint, if you feel free, if you want to provide your contact information, or you could just send it to us, and we'll make it available, whatever is easiest. Awesome. If there are any other questions, feel free to drop them in the Q and A. Perfect. Yeah, so you're, everybody's welcome to reach out with any kind of questions and, you know, don't feel overwhelmed. We have a very large group of people working on this, so you might not be able to roll out everything all at once, but we have nine professional staff now, four graduate assistants, 20 tutors, all working with these courses because we have such a large student population. So we can do a lot of these things, but hopefully you don't feel overwhelmed by information overload. Um, Maybe just take one or two pieces, not all of it, <laughs> small bites. Absolutely. Um, just a comment. I'm glad to hear that you have this still ongoing at a four-year institution. Our community college cut our program last year, sadly, and cut, and cut all of our developmental courses and co-requisite courses. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, everyone. We're just about at time. So um, thank you, Kelly and Tyler, for all the valuable information you shared today about your wonderful program. Uh, the next session is our keynote is the next session is our lunch keynote speaker, Dr. Jackie Leone. You can view the chat for the session meeting room link or access the conference website for a complete list of concurrent sessions and their descriptions. While accessing the conference website, don't forget to swing by the virtual exhibit hall to say hello to our Hawks team. While there, you have a quick five minute demonstration, request your t-shirt and be entered to win in a $50 hourly giveaway. Also in the spirit of St. Patrick's Day, you'll find a few golden coins throughout the conference website. Click on the coins to be entered for a chance to win an additional raffle. And we're excited to see you at the next session. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Kelly and Tyler. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you for your time, everyone.